So everybody's here. Good evening. I hope you're good. Uh, so tonight we're going to have the class split in two um, uh, different blocks. Uh, so first we welcome uh, Elko, who is going to talk about the five uh, big business models inside the, the music industry and also uh, some marketing things and about what he's been doing through his career and the platform that he's uh, developing and growing at the moment. And then the second part will be with Task Force Go, which is like a new program from Buma Semra. And that's about hands um, uh, over sliding gedra. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something like this. I don't know how to say it, but I think you. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, yeah like me too. Yeah, this. Um, and, and so they made a whole study about um, this kind of dynamics inside the industry. And there's also a whole program of communication around it. So I think that would be a quite an interesting evening. But first, we have uh, Elko, um, who's been working in the industry for long time from all kinds of different angles, from uh, labels, management, publishing, and um, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Malik. Thank, thank you for the thank introduction. You for okay. My name is uh, Eelco van Kooten. I'm, uh, I'm an experienced uh, music entrepreneur. Uh, I started in the 90s, way back. <laughs> Some of the, you maybe were not even born. And um, I started first out as a, in, the, in the publishing business. My father had a record label and a publishing company. And I didn't know what to do at that time when I was young to, okay, uh, to start a career. And I didn't know exactly what I was really liking. So he said, okay, well, come work for me in my music publishing company. So I started off doing administration first and I saw that, uh, uh, that I liked the publishing business. So, and, and of course, administration is, the, is key to do that properly. But after that, uh, I started with uh, uh, exploitation because if you have songs in a publishing company, yeah, you need to work on them. And, uh, and, uh, and when you have songs, uh, what you exploit, you again need writers to create new songs. So step by step, I learned all the phases in the music, biz uh, in the music publishing business. And after that, I started, uh, I saw as a publisher that the songs which were written by my writers could be promoted better. Uh, so then I saw, uh, I thought, okay, let's start on the, uh, on the record label side as well, uh, by helping uh, artists and, and back catalog exploit and administer in a better way. Um, which first you start on royalty side as a record label, that's the administration. Then second you start, you know, on exploitating and uh, and the last phase more or less is the A and R. So I went through all the phases on the publishing and the masters, uh, and that was for my father's publishing company in the 90s and I saw you know a big trend coming up and that was dance music so in 98 I started my own publishing company specialized in dance music uh, called musical stuff publishing uh, and then a year and uh, I had a lot of writers but again the writers which I represented including uh, Armin van Buren I saw that the records they were producing and releasing by the labels were not properly handled. So I thought I could do a better job. So a year later, I started, aside from my publishing company, also a record label, and that was Spinning Records uh, in '99. Um, and um, uh, out of that, uh, um, I started it because I could do a better job. Uh, but also, yeah, the dance music uh, I chose for especially that category because it's international, either instrumental, so you have no boundaries of language, or uh, if you use a language and it's English, it's, it's uh, without borders. It's good for Holland, but also internationally. So that's the reason why, and also dance music, uh, you know, if you have an artist uh, like Taylor Swift of Dua Lipa, they, do, they work on an album, uh, two years and then they promote release it and promote it for two years so they take three or four singles and they they promote it so you cannot uh, and after three four singles they stop promoting the records they do a tour and so there's there's more or less a gap in the release schedule so i thought in the dance music you could use music every three months every time you djs want to have <coughs> new music so i thought okay that's fluid there's a constant flow of of uh, then of music in the dance music so i thought okay let's start with that um so uh, out of that 
uh, yeah, we had quite success in, in Holland because there was an international league following in the dance music. It was accepted by, we had the Roxy, for example, uh, clubs who were playing that so you could make a living. And also Holland is quite small. So if you have a record out, you can promote it eh? on Friday night. You can have three gigs uh, at, at the same day because Holland is only, you know, if you drive an hour, you're in the next big city and you can do a perfor another performance, which is impossible in France or in Germany or England. So uh, there was a big following in the dance music. But OK, so that's what I did. Uh, and uh, because I had the phases on the music publishing, on the records and also helping artists building careers, I have a lot of experience in, in the music industry. So that's the reason for you guys and Bislord Academy uh, asked me to talk about the five revenue streams in the music industry. Because uh, if you are on a an, on an, uh, birthday party and you have to tell, okay, what do you do and in what exactly uh, is, is your, uh, your role in the music industry. So that's quite complicated sometimes to explain. Uh, I still, uh, for me, it's still complicated to my friends to explain what I did or what I'm doing. So this is why we put it in um, in uh, in the schedule, like the big five. You know, in Africa, you have the big five. So I thought, okay, in the music industry, what is the big five? Um, so I understand there's a lot of writers, composers, and singer-songwriters uh, and producers here. So um, this is uh, where it all starts. Uh, and there's a chronologi chronologic following uh, in the five words. ...in a music profile, and that's about a management or a manager. And once you have success, you know, and hopefully with the right manager and the right music, you have success, then all of a sudden you get bookings. So you need a booking agency. And when you have a lot of bookings and you are very popular, you can have your own event or you are booked for events. So these are the big five. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of more roles in the music industry, but if you take a look at, okay, what's like artwork or creatives in artwork or marketing, it all comes back to one of these five, more or less. Like artwork you use for events, a flyer, or you use it for a production or for the bookings. Yeah, if you are on a flyer, you need artwork. So that's, that's another role, which is not mentioned here, but it's all tied up to more or less these five uh, words. And these five words have, again, all their own rights in management uh, and income stream and, and business model. So Ooh. if you take a look at the publishing, you can see it all, or I have to step away. <laughs> it's very small words, but we, we send it out so you can share it and read it afterwards. Yeah, share it with everybody. Yeah. So, like, so yeah, if you are a producer, you know, you use a lot of covers. What is then uh, publishing for you? What does that mean? Or if you are a writer, but you're not a producer and you're not a manager, what does, what does that mean exactly? So. Music publishing is a composition, consists of text and music, and music is made by an author, and artists together is recorded as a demo, more or less. A demo is not a production. These days on the laptop, it is almost a production finished, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's a rough version of a production which could be released later, um, I would say. Uh, on the rights of the publishing, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, the license term of a production. You have, you have your own production, uh, your own publishing. So, and uh, that's, that's in Holland protected 70 years after the writer composer dies, uh, which is a lot. So that means over hundred years, so also for the next generations, which is really cool because yeah, if you pass away, you know, your children and grandchildren still have a copyright, which could be really, really nice, you know, to leave it as a legacy behind. Um, is that clear for everybody? The, the thing, the copyright, what it means exactly the in protection. the protection. Yeah. Like, Same when you have masters. questions, uh, shoot, huh? Like, uh, yeah, the whole idea is, you know, I can talk about what I know, but it's more, more, it's better to understand what you don't know yet, so we can talk about it, and we do that through questions. So I'm very open, you know, if you have a question along the way, just interrupt and ask the questions. 
that's that's the whole reason I think why we are here to yeah. share information. I think I know a lot, <laughs> and I'm happy to share it. That's my my idea here. So so rights, you know, publishing rights and also master rights and also like branding rights or uh, Octroia are protected, uh, and that's the good thing. So if someone else is using your song, you know, another artist. Uh, then it's at least protected. So you're investing it in with your time. And if it's successful, yeah, at least you know it's protected. A pub publishers, again, can protect your rights. That's the role of, uh, of a publisher. Uh, so the revenue stream uh, on the publishing is in Holland and France is different and Germany and England as well. So you have to be uh, taken in consideration of which uh, copyright society you're a member of because there are different splits, but more or less it comes to one third. Yeah, it comes back to three uh, people who are involved, like the publisher, the author and the composer. And if you have an instrumental track, there's no lyric, then it's 50-50. That's automatically how it is done. Uh, the business model is compensation for the publisher, author and composer for the use of their compensation. You know, like Buma Stemra, they do the collection. So you need to register your song, they do the collection and they pay it out. And if you have, you know, if you're a France uh, writer, you're a member of SASM or, or SDRM, they collect your publishing and they have a reciprocal agreement with each other with Bimas Timmer. So Bimas, if a radio station wants to broadcast and use your music, they need to have a license from Buma to uh, broadcast your songs. Uh, and they collect the money and they pay it out. Um, so the publisher, he has two or even three jobs, you know. Uh, everybody is always talking about ah, publishing, publishing rights. What is he doing uh, separate from paying advances, for example? But you can, a publisher is not making music itself. So there's a role already. They need music and the publisher needs to exploit it, uh, administer it and do acquisitions for the writer, composer they represent. So that's three tasks of a publisher. Can I ask what do you mean by exploit? Like they need to exploit it? I don't know what that means. If you have publishing, you're a writer, composer and you have a and, and you have a song, but that's, that's if you are only a writer, so you're not an artist or you don't produce it, then still you have a song uh, written and, and, and recorded, but you need to have an artist, for example, or uh, you need to have it released if you're a singer songwriter. Um, so exploitation means that the role of a publisher or the writer themselves is to have it recorded so, and put it on spot. is to pitch it to artists or to pitch it to record labels or set up a writing camp so you can write together and then the songs what is produced you know the publisher cannot make music itself you know it's a company so they need music they need music to exploit and once it's exploited it's played on on Buma or it's played on the radio or in a movie or in a game or on YouTube then you need to administer it so you need to register first and then Buma needs to pay to, uh, the radio needs to pay to Buma, and Buma needs to pay to the writer, composer, and the publisher. But the thing is, the writer, composer, they are creators, and they have to work on the music making, and not necessarily on the administration of the music itself. So if you get Buma paid, by, uh, if you have performing rights paid by Buma to you as a writer, how do you know if that's correct, the payment? That's part of what the publisher does. And that's administration, so not only registration, but also checking if what you get is correct. And exploitating is making sure the song is, re is released, so at least it's making money. And the third uh, task of a publisher is acquisitions. And what I mean is with acquisitions, most of the time you, you sign a publishing deal, not just for one song, but multiple songs for an exclusive deal. So they have the rights on you as a writer, on your creative talent, but also on the songs. And they need to uh, work on the songs that uh, it's released or promoted. But also, uh, as a publisher, you work on a career of a writer-composer. 
So an acquisition, I mean with that, is that you have to get jobs to write for a specific artist, a specific song. So other than have the songs pitched on the shelf, you know, and get them out there, they need also to get jobs for you, remixing, production, or writing songs for a commercial or for a specific artist. That's acquisition. So work on, so the publisher's role is to work on the career of a writer. More or less also a little bit management, but then specifically for the writer. So help the career develop. So this is publishing, uh, the most part, because if you don't have publishing, if you don't have songs, yeah, yeah, you don't have a production, you don't have uh, bookings, you don't have events. So it all starts with publishing. So the production, what is a production? Can we can we read yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, I'm trying to. I have no idea how Maybe this works, I can it. read it out loud a little bit. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Can I have a question? Yeah, always. So what time would you suggest to search for publishers? Yeah, you need to have, to have proper songs. You need to sell yourself as to a publisher, or if you have a lot of success, yeah, the publishers will come to you. Um, but that's uh, where are you in your career, uh, and what do you need them? You know, it's good that you produce songs and you think always, ah, yeah, I have hits, I write hit songs, you know, but you need feedback. So that's part of, you know, why you can have a manager or a publisher. Talk with your publisher, what can, I, can you do better? What is working, what is not working? Like more or less like an A&R, you need some guidance. Uh, so that's, that's uh, all, they always, you know, wave with a check and, but it's not about, yeah, that's, that's a good start. But what happens after that? You know, that's a lot of publishers forget that or writers. You know, you need, you need a publisher where you have a good connection with, who is active in the music area, in the kind of music what you make. And also that you need guidance from a publisher um, because it's, it's about a collaboration. They get one third of the money, you know, in Holland, the publishing chair. So, uh, but you could also say, uh, no, they have to earn the one third. You know, so make them work for you, I would say. That's more important than the big check because a big check and no, nothing happens. Yeah, that's, yeah, then you don't have a career. So it's all, always up to yourself. And again, a publisher doesn't make music. So you need to make music and you need to hear what kind of music is popular. So, ah, this is better. It's better. Okay, but I, I'll, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> So again, you know, we we make a, we on the publishing like it's description, it's rights, it's revenue. So we did the same on the production. So what is a production? That is not not a song, but it's a track. So you can hear it. A song, you know, uh, publishing comes from 50 years ago when you had lyrics and you had music notes in written. So if you if you have music but you cannot hear it, then it's publishing anyway, like notes a g note and you yeah, you write music in notes and if it's recorded then you have track that's the production that's more or less the difference in short a track is a release ready recording of a demo with the performing artist so it's it's ready to be uh, to have included on spotify often is it the case that the author is also the artist like with singer songwriter and then the artist is also the ownership of the release then for singer-songwriters, that's easy. Um, the recording can also involve multiple artists, multiple parties, such as a producer, singer, session, musician, such as a drummer, guitarist, etc. The artist can release the recording themselves via Spotify, but has to do their own promotion. That's if you are self-independent, uh, promoted, and do-it-yourself artist. The second is, and, and to be honest, the, at the moment on Spotify, they're released every day 150,000 tracks by independent artists. That's, that's huge. So it's not about putting it on Spotify, but it's about, okay, how do I get people to listen to my track on Spotify? That's the whole uh, mathematics. That's the chemistry. And second is, a record company releases the artist's recording and takes care of the promotion and exploitation in exchange for a fee. So that's all all about okay where are you in your career and is the music good enough or at least or you don't know the road you know record labels 10 years ago they released like spinning records they released 15 tracks per week and still they do the same they will re still release 15 tracks per week 
But in the meantime, the independent uh, artist world is exploded, you know, on the tracks because everyone has a laptop and you can upload your music on Spotify yourself. So there's a lot of offering of independent music uh, and that, that's blown away. A record label? Yeah. No, because you still need to promote it. And that's an, uh, and doesn't, uh, for a record label like Universal, you know, it doesn't mean there's only one Dua Lipa. Uh, they release records to look for the new Dua Lipa. Um, but it's like an organization, like uh, I'll, I'll explain to you, like Sony Music, they have 4 million copyrights, but only 30,000 out of the 4 million are synced every year. And their, their benefit is not to do 60,000 things, no, they sit and wait. Because then the amount is the same, but the revenue is very high. So that's about creating um, uh, schaarste. Uh, what is that, schaarste? Um, yeah. So, and the same with the artists, like Spinning Records, still you need, you know, you, uh, you have a big organization. So you need to release records, which you also can promote and make money out of it. So if you put more records in the system, it doesn't mean necessarily that you make more money. But the costs are very high. Uh, so it's all about, okay, records are an investment and you need to make it back. Um, but the bad thing is, you know, they still release more or less the same amount of releases. So, but in the, in the meantime, there's a lot of more music being offered. So that's a big uh, discrepancy uh, between offering and releases um, so it's better you know to work on it yourself because there's chances and that's what i meant with a record label the chances to have a record deal that's very minimal to be honest so you can have luck uh, but you have to do it yourself first to create the opportunity that a record label is interested in you that means you have to be original in the music but also you need to have already an artist profile because it's much easier for spinning records to promote an artist which has already 100,000 followers on social media than to start with an artist nobody knows. Uh, at least you need to start somewhere and then it's better for uh, labels that they start with an artist who has already some profile. Um, so back to the rights. Um, uh, a production has master rights to the recording belonging to the makers of the recording, if you are a do-it-yourself artist, or are transferred to a label, record label, for a specific term, and that can be three to 15 years, or whatever you negotiate with the label, or indefinite period of time, in perpetuity. That's, that's what happened uh, in the past, you know, ABBA is still with Universal, because uh, ABBA signed the records away for in perpetuity. That, mean, that doesn't mean that the record label has the rights and they don't have to do anything. No, they're still, you know, in balance that you have rights and because you make money, you still have to put effort in the records. So that's the reason why you so now and then see big artists being re-released or in a movie or being promoted because um, uh, not in America or England necessarily because there's freedom of agreement, but in Europe, in the new intellectual property uh, legislation, you have uh, rules that if you have rights, uh, uh, you uh, cannot sit on it. You have to promote also. Uh, that's by, by, by rule, by law. Uh, and where uh, are those laws decided? Is it like a, a European? That's in thing? the copyright law in the Netherlands, in Europe. The European Europe, copyright yeah, okay. law yeah. says that you have right. If you have rights, you have to do something with it. Yeah. Okay. So, and in Holland, there is a buitenrechtelijke ontbinding. It's a typical word. Mm -hmm. And Holland was one of the first countries uh, who had these specific exclusions that if you have rights, you need to promote it. So, if you have a, if you transfer publishing rights or a master right to a record label or publisher, mm -hmm. and 10, 15, 20 years, nothing happened with the song, and you ask the, the label or the publisher by saying, okay, you have these rights. What are you going to do with it for three or six months? Then you could terminate the agreement. Okay. And is it, uh, is it connected to uh, a result or do they have, you have to show that you are proactively 
working the, the a record uh, label has not the right but also the obligation to promote mm -hmm. and that's in the law yes. uh, now first it was uh, a gray area that it's uh it's a common rule by saying if you have something you need to promote it on the rights mm -hmm. uh, and now it's even in the copyright law okay which is really in balance because why uh, because the publisher gets one third but and the writer composer gets two thirds but they suffer if the publisher doesn't do a job yeah. so uh, it's to protect With the EMI, I think it was 2010. So the revenue stream on a do-it-yourself artist is because you have all the rights, you get all the money. Uh, but you have to do your own promotion and uh, you have to put it on uh, Spotify yourself. And if you have a record label, they do that for you. Promotion, marketing, they invest in, they invest in your career. They put it on Spotify and they ask a royalty between 20 and 50%. So the business model of, of a production is either you do it yourself do-it-yourself artist directly and you put it on Spotify you know there's a lot of uh, platforms who do that uh, either by payment a flat fee or by a royalty or you go to a record label and they put it on uh, Spotify themselves but if you have a record label again and that's what we talked earlier about they need to promote it they need to do marketing on the production uh, and uh, on record deals on agreements always make sure that's in balance you give them rights but they have to do something with these rights. So always look in, in the things, okay, about the guarantees on promotion, what they do. And how can you increase the revenue stream on the production? Well, that's by promoting the success of the recording through, through foreign promotion, through sync, through more radio and TV airplay, because if it's on the radio or TV, you get neighboring rights. Uh, but if it's not on the radio, it's not promoted well. Yeah, there's no income to be generated. <laughs> So yeah, playlisting, pitching on Spotify, etc. So these are the things, either you have to do it yourself as a do-it-yourself artist, or a you go to a record label and they're interested in you and they do, they do that for you because that's their business model. Mm. Where is it? So oh, the third one out of the five is the management because yeah, it's all complicated, you know, not if you do it yourself, you are in charge, but again, yeah, you have to do it yourself. Uh, and that's always challenging. The good thing is you can make music easily now with laptops. Well, not easily, I'm not a music producer, but you can make music. And also you can use tools to uh, improve your music, but also make promotion, uh, playlisting. Uh, you can do that by uh, a lot of tools on, on internet. I'm here also because I'm founder and, and um, uh, of a collab house and you can work with influencers for example just to create exposure because an artist he has music and he wants to share it uh, in, in return for exposure and an influencer part of their DNA is that they have music which suits their DNA it's part of who they are only influencers are really afraid of using music because most of the time it's blocked uh, or they're afraid of red flags on YouTube. So why not work together in a very transparent way? So an artist uh, uploads the music through Collab House, but also is looking in the marketplace for the right influencer and they can search on what kind of influencer they are looking for. And an influencer is looking for music and is looking uh, through all kinds of uh, search engines, the kind of music and, and uh, the language and the territory and the BPM. And all of a sudden there's a marketplace of influencers who look for music and they bring exposure and an artist brings music and they look for exposure. It's a very organic, natural way of working together, very transparent. And even if you have some budget, you can pay for influencers like they got paid for a brand, a shampoo brand. Uh, why not pay for artist promotion? And Record labels do that, so, but that's all always a little bit fake. Eh? Who are they working with and how much does it cost? And on Collab House, you can work yourself uh, through the system and find your ideal music partner or 
uh, influencing partner. Uh, so that's that's a little bit about. Uh, Is that clear about this platform? Collab house. Because I think that's also in the phase where you're at now that you release the first tracks by yourselves and and you don't have a label or anything. It can be really a powerful tool to uh, yeah to connect to influencers. Yeah, so I think to promote because the tracks. you know if you have great music but it's badly promoted, yeah, that, that's uh, a. Uh, that's a track nobody knows. Or if you have a, a not so good record and it's very good promoted, it's a record nobody knows. So it's all about making the right track, but also doing the right promotion. And if you don't do anything, you know, you have a great track and that's it. <laughs> and you don't do anything, yeah, nothing will happen. So it's 50-50. It's about the track, but it's also about the promotion, I would say. But you are, yeah, you experience that along the way. So, and the good thing is, like I explained, you, there's a lot of tools to make music, to improve, to use samples on Tracklip or, uh, uh, um, you know, on AI you can make music, but AI is also making music, that's a little bit different. But now you can also use, you know, promotion tools uh, to promote your music and to reach that audience, including Colepas. But also Playlister to get it pitched to playlisting. And this is something you can do. But to create your own success as an independent artist or to create that success to get attention from record labels because that's uh, as important as, as to focus on your do-it-yourself artist's uh, release, to create exposure. Um, and part of guidance, you know, once you are there and you're an independent artist, yeah, it, publishers come to you or record labels come to you. And that's where a management or a manager comes in. Uh, because a manager, to be honest, uh, and on spinning records, we were management with artists who didn't make any money yet. But I thought the vision was, okay, an artist, he needs two things. He needs an artist profile and a an, uh, music profile. Because if you look on a flyer or a festival, you see an artist's name and you know exactly what kind of music he's making. And that's the artist, that's the music profile. And how do you create music profile? That's to put out music, eh, what suits you. To, so do, don't change too much. Uh, first think about your music profile, and put out on a regular basis the right amount of music. So every two months, every six weeks, every three months, put out a release. Because if you want to create fan base, you know, people, it's all about engagement. And people expect after three releases, when the fourth release will come, they understand that. Same on posting. If you post one post on Instagram every day or every week, you know, people expect. Or when you don't do it, if you put it out every, every day and then you, a week you don't post anything, then you don't get higher in your algorithm and people lose out engagement or attention. So it's a music profile you build with a regular basis putting out the music and that's a typical style what suits you to know on the flyer people uh, not not the big DJs but uh, smaller DJs uh, they understand uh, from the artist's name what kind of music it is so really understand that that that's how you create engagement to put out to be consistent on the music releases but also on the music what you put out and an artist profile that's you know like a soccer player you can be a fan of a soccer player but a soccer player you know he's only playing a game one time a week so what else can you do to create more engagement as a soccer player that's to post things about who you are not about that you are a great player but also what food you like or what fashion or what cars or family or whatever interesting things because you follow not necessarily an artist because of his music but also about who he is and that's what we call an artist profile and that makes it very interesting because if you talk about a release that's every six weeks or every two months or every three months a release so you can talk on social media how you make it how you put it out and what happens with the release afterwards but there's a lot of gaps on social media to fill you know and that's good to fill it with you know uh, an artist goes to the hairdresser or he goes to uh, have dinner with his friends to show the fans who you are and that's but still it needs to be organic because if it's a trick 
you know if you let if you show something which is not which is not real people the fans will see that so like on Dua Lipa you know everything she's very popular with the girls because she's one of them she has the right age that's that's part of who she is and she shows that if she does a brand deal it's organic it suits her and her fan base so that's very to be precise on that you have to be very consistent with that otherwise it's a sell out and people yeah lose attention you understand what i mean and all these things you know uh can do management for you to keep an eye on artist profile keep an eye on the music profile and start to building the brand because that is what you do I have a question. yes so uh, this is what you did in the beginning before the social media yeah tell me yeah and so then how would you do it then back then without social media? yeah in the 2000s uh, 2010 you know social media came up so that was really something interesting because the, the major record labels and the major publishers in the 2000s they were afraid of internet of casa and napster because you have to understand that in 2012 the record industry the music industry was bankrupt you know then warner was bought and EMI was put together. EMI went bankrupt. I don't know if you remember that. And that was because we had, we came from vinyl, you know, LPs, vinyl, that was huge income stream. Then CD came, but CD was quite expensive, you know, 25 euro for an album in Holland. But to, ma to make it, to have the CD, it was only 60 cents. So there was a big margin. And because it was so expensive, people put it on the internet. Uh, Alta Vista and Napster, Casa, that was around 2000. So major record labels were afraid of internet in general because they were losing a lot of money with that and they had already bad times. And for spinning records, we thought, okay, we cannot reach audience in Russia. Uh, but internet, through internet, we could build a fan base. So that's where we thought as a pioneer by saying, okay, all the record labels are afraid of internet, so they don't want to share their internet, their music on the internet, so they kill it. And where we said, okay, now our new artists, they want to share it on the internet with fans. So we, uh, that was our unique selling point. So, yeah, so that was something where we were really in advance of. That's the reason why YouTube, why Spinning Records had the biggest music label, uh, and was uh, top 10 biggest partner channels in the world on, on YouTube and still is because we were really in advance. Because on Mexico there was no revenue on music, but we had a big following on YouTube channels. So at least they could listen to our music and knew the, our DJs. So when they were booked in Mexico, although we could not make money out of the records because in Mexico there were no CD shops and internet uh, download I think you remember iTunes, yeah. you still need to have a great network uh, to download a track on your mobile phone or, or to have a subscription on Apple. And you always needed to have a credit card. And in Mexico, people don't have speed uh, internet and they don't have a credit card. Or So at least our music we could share. That was the advantage of internet. Um, and before that, uh, we promoted music, the dance music in the 90s, because the DJs, I think you remember white labels. So we gave that to the DJs. The DJs played in clubs, three clubs in one night, and they were playing our new music. So that was so it was really bottom up. Small clubs, bigger clubs, festivals, and then to the radio. And now all of, now it's all about the internet. And internet is the world. And in the 90s it was all small, in, starting in the local club in Amsterdam and Rotterdam and Paris and you know the so it was really bottom up, step by step, improving the exposure. Um, and you could see on the sales of vinyl that it was a success. So you start, you kept on pressing vinyl. But the bad thing is that once, you know, we had another hit, we stopped pressing vinyl. It was not in the shop anymore. So it fell down the chart and it could not be exploited because it was not in the shop anymore. And now, can you imagine, Alba is always on stock. You know, you don't need to put a pr press of vinyl or a CD to put it in the shop. No, it's always on Spotify. It's always in stock. So that's totally a whole different mind game. And also a different way of marketing, promoting, making product. Um, very exciting, totally different. But the bad thing is, 
it was segmented, you could do the marketing to the shop. So that's, that's marketing in the shop itself. And now you have to promote it on the internet, which is everywhere. So that's, you know, that's the good thing is uh, there's music easily to be made, but there's a, but the bad thing is there's a lot of music. Yeah, and a lot of territory as well. The world. The bottom up is not possible anymore on Spotify. That's the reason why I sold spinning records, more or less. Because everything, you know, also Martin Garrix, we signed him with an independent record. We had, we had a hit on Beatport with Animals. And then it went to Radio 528 with a dance machine. Then we went to France, Germany. Then it was a top 10 hit. Then we went to England and then we conquered the US. But that's impossible now because if you put it on Spotify, it's everywhere. So the reason why uh, you saw a whole different dynamics, because then, uh, because if you have a hit in America, you have a hit everywhere because of the absolute numbers. It's 250 million people in America. So if you have a stream hit there, like Chainsmokers or Marshmallow or Justin Bieber, you know, in 2017, Justin Bieber put out an album on Spotify and you had, top f you had five tracks of him in the top 10 in Holland in Spotify because he had success in the US. So it's a whole different marketing tool uh, and problems as well. How do you, you know, um, if you look at Spotify now, the top 50 in France or Germany or Holland, it's totally different. Still, you see Chesto and Taylor Swift, top five, you know, top 10. Five out of them are international and five is very local because local radio is promoting local music as well. So management is part of giving you guidance for publishing, yeah, a management can do also only a writer uh, if you are big enough or, uh, a, or an artist, you know, to help you with the right record label, the right promotion to uh, check what the record label is doing. You know, if they say we do promotion in So not too early because there's not no money. So then you do maybe a bad deal. Or if you have already success, then you go to a successful manager who has success with other artists. So you can see what he did. Where did he break the artists? Where did he bring them to? You know, because the role of a manager is to give you, to, um, to bring you to the next phase, not to do the same. Yeah, you can do it yourself. <laughs> so it's, yeah, and so you need, the, the manager who can bring you to the next level. And then you have to look in this artist roster. Okay, did he do that before? Like Jos Verstappen, he's the manager of Max Verstappen. But he brought him to the next phase because he was already experienced. He had already deals. He had already endorsements. He had already success. So he was the best manager for, for Max. You see sometimes footballers you know, they have a manager who is the dad. Then you need to be careful because management or a manager is a real job. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah, the father says, and, and it's, it can be okay, you know, but you need to have experience as a manager in the business where you are in to bring you to the next phase. And the best managers are the, the ones who did it before. You know, so at least, you know, you know that's okay. You know about their success. So, uh, so the revenue stream is 20% in general. In America it's 10, but 10 out of the top. And in Holland is it 20% with, because it's the top minus certain costs sometimes. And increasing earnings 
uh, the job of a manager is in, yeah, bring the artist to the next phase to increase the earnings. And how do you do that? Yeah, on the publishing, you need to do a publishing deal or work, check the publisher uh, or put them together. Be, be um, um, yeah, very, um, how do you say that? Um, string, what is the word string? Strict. Strict, strict on what, so the manager needs to be strict on what the publisher is doing or the record label to check them, you know, they have big stories and say, yeah, blah, blah. and if it, and if it's not a hit, it's everybody's fault, you know, <laughs> and then the manager needs to figure out, okay, who did not do what they're supposed to do. So maybe we go to the next income. Then bookings agency, what kind of artists do they have? Is there competition, similar artists, or do they have success with other artists? Because like with DJs, there's always a headliner and there's always a an, programma. An, uh, What's programma? Pre-programmed. Huh? Pre-programmed. Pre-programmed. And it's good, you know, that uh, and you saw that a lot happening with DJs and also with other artists, that they promote another artist. So, Take a look at booking of bookings agencies who have art bigger artists than you yourself, because then you can be sold next to them to a festival. Like a festival, you see the headliners, that's the most important, and the rest are booked along with big artists most of the time. So that's the leverage what you are looking for in a booking agency. So it's all about their network. Um, but again, a booking agent is picking up the phone and is doing the booking. But to create the booking itself, you need to be popular. Uh, so part of that is that, you know, what does a booking agency? Yeah, they, they book you at the right time, at the right place, with the right uh, spot on the flyer, with the right fee. And think about a booking a um, tour manager which comes along or collecting the money. You know, that's all about, but that's more or less when there is already success because there's no uh, events, there's no bookings, when there's no popularity, more or less. And if you're not so popular, I'd rather, I should advise you that you do the booking yourself, you know, along the way until it's too much, then you look for the right booking agency. So, um, because the booking itself, the booking agency, is not delivering the bookings when there's no music success, when there's no um, artist profile. I would say. Do you have tips for uh, getting started with doing bookings for yourself? Like where to start? Yeah, like there's an app called uh, GZ. 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 And we promoted that on uh, Collab House. That's more or less, if you are looking, you know, if you're an artist like a DJ or a singer, then either you go to a booking agency, but then they say, okay, but uh, where's your fan base? Where's your hit? Because then I can promote it to a venue, to a... Uh, and then maybe they will book you. So you need to create your own exposure. You need to create the reason why they should book you in a venue. But there's a, much, there's, there's, there's a way to create fan base. That's also to do live bookings on a braderie, a small events, or a birthday party, or a, a, a marriage uh, parties, etc. And DJ bookings can do those bookings where people are looking for artists, specific genre, whatever. And artists are offering themselves GZ. So, like like I said on the internet, there's a lot of things you can do yourself. Yeah, D D J E E Z Y, I think. That's from France. They're not so much active in the Netherlands yet, but they're in France active and also in England. But they're coming. So, and but that's just an example. Maybe, maybe there are more. You know, like it's marketplaces a birthday party, you know, it's cool to have a singer for 250 euro or a DJ. And the DJ likes to get um, experience. And also maybe if that's 60 people, maybe it's new fans. You have to start somewhere. Martin Garris was 14 when he played at birthday parties.
So you never know. Um, but if you have the right booking agency at the right time in your career, so let's say there's already success, then like on Martin Garrix, it's a good example. He did the birthday parties, then he went with friends from Amsterdam to a small event and don't let daddy know, he played in Privilege when he was 16. He could, not, he could not even be on the stage. And that was before he had animals. But at least, you know, he was in the early time in the event, you know, playing. Maybe he was opener, which is cool, you know. But at least he was there. He was on the flyer. He could post it on social media. And other people see the name as well. So that's all about marketing. And when he had animals, it was important for us that to... Uh, have him in uh, parties in Holland to create, okay, because then they see name Martin Garrix and they see animals. They have no clue how he looks like unless you follow him. So to, to cre create your fan base, people need to see who you are. That's the artist profile. So you have the music profile, they know you, your name from the record. But artist profile, now they know to see you, you know, backstage, front stage, on the, on the stage. That's what you can show on social media. And then they become a fan of you. And then we had him in an energy party, you know, to create more uh, uh, exposure for him as an artist. And we hired in America, William Morris Entertainment, WME. That's the biggest booking agency. And they were having a lot of success with Marshmallow, for example. And the booker there said, okay, we put him uh, on all the big festivals, not that year, 2013, because everything was all happening. But for the 2014, he was very young. He was, 2014, he was uh, 16, 17 maybe, when he was playing in Coachella. And because he was in a very cool uh, stage on Coachella, uh, America thought, okay, this guy is there, so it must be something. And then they started playing his music and we created fan base because of that. But it also, so sometimes with the right booking agency, you can, create fan base, you know, to have, have them push you at the right time on the right stage. So yeah, you can make some noise. That happened in 2014 with Martin Garrick. So he was in March, he was on Ultra, he played in the Live, he was on Ultra 2014. Then in April, he was in Coachella. So then all of a sudden he was the new guy. But if you don't do that and you sit, stay in Holland, yeah, you they know you from the record, but they don't know who it is exactly. And people still, the fans want to see who it is. That's your artist profile. They want to be fan of the music, but also of the artist. So a booking agent can be part of that, uh, essential part of that. Here we go to the next. Because if you have the right song publishing, if you have the right record, uh, record success, then you have the right manager who does the right who finds the right booking agency so you create artist profile and music profile at the same time then you can be on events uh, like festivals or you do your own tour but to have a tour in holland like uh, yeah, theaters or carré they the owner of the uh, tour of the club or the venue they want to sell out tickets so they're never gonna do a tour if they don't know for sure that you sell our tickets. So, and you sell our tickets when you have fans who also buy tickets. So first you need to be on events, other people's events, like Ultra, EDC, or in Holland, uh, Koningsdag, uh, Kings, Kings Day, to create fan base, because maybe you are the, not the biggest artist, but at least you are on the stage where also bigger artists are. And the audience, the fans are there as well. So then you get create a moment of exposure for yourself to build your fan base. Until the so so if you are on an event like King King's Day or Kingsland, it's King's Day, then you get a flat fee payment because you are booked. And but always don't forget that you are there and you get money to perform there. But it's much more important on these great uh, events that you reach. You create more exposure to the fans, to future fans, so you create engagement. The same is why a lot of DJs, they want to play, you know, you have different venues, you have the big expensive clubs like Liv in, in uh, Miami or Las Vegas, there, there you get rich as a DJ because people go there uh, and spend crazy money in the, in the casino 
and they go a night out to Chesto. So Chesto, so it's it's not about fan base that specific performance. It's about entertainment for the the high rollers, the big gamblers. So you have these kinds of venue, events, you know, where you make a lot of money, but you don't do anything on your fan base. But then again, you have Tomorrowland, for example, where DJs like Chesto they've ask for one third of the normal fee because they there's hundred thousand people where they play for and and that's all about popularity and and there's a live stream you're in radio shows so that's a big promotion for to be there not a, and it's not about the money the money is made in las vegas we are never there we we'll never be there you know and that's not the real fan base the fan base is the people who stream who buy merchandise and that's not in las vegas so they get rich in las vegas but to build the fan base, yeah, you need to be on Tomorrowland. That's cool. So, um, so that's the event. So, and when Chesto is very popular, you know, he can sell his own tickets. Uh, or Adele, for example, you know, Ida De Gay, she does a tour in Las Vegas. Why? Because she gets 200 million, you know, for one year to perform there. So it's not about fan base, but it's about money. Um, and uh, and so Tomorrowland is about fan base. Or you do a tour, but then, like Chesto, he's not playing uh, for a thousand people in the air in Amsterdam. No, he's playing then in the Rye, you know, for 10,000 people. And then he makes, not like a, a, a fee, like on Tomorrowland. No, he makes, he gets 70% of the ticket sales. And the ticket sales is 100 euro, 70% goes to him. He hires people or his manager or they hire people to build the stage, you know. Um, but that's only when you are very big. So, um, so, uh, and also there's other events like Mercedes in, is introducing a new model of a car and they hire an artist to make it cool. That's, yeah, then it's, you're, there's no tickets, there's no coolness like Tomorrowland or Las Vegas, but then it's just a paid performance. And it's only f uh, on the event itself, so it's not even public. So these are the kind of events what you can do. So that's more or less the big five, in a nutshell. Yeah. And there's questions? a lot of questions to be asked, I hope. Yeah. Tell me. Yes, tell me. So you mentioned that you spend a good amount of time on marketing. Oh, who did that? Uh, you? Yeah. I do that. Yeah. As a record label, you mean? Or as oh, an independent yeah. artist? Yeah, you, you mentioned something about uh, spending time on marketing. And yeah. Yeah, you are a writer, artist, producer? I am a songwriter and producer. And singer-songwriter? Yeah. yeah, because as a producer you make your own recordings and you sing it as well. So it's it's about, you know, either you have to be careful what, what it is, what you want to sell. Is it the song you want to sell as a writer or do you want to sell the production and yourself as an artist? Then you can use and create artist profile. So on the marketing, it's very, uh, it's very essential that you need to be sure about, okay, what, what am I going to do? What is my career? Is it songwriting behind the scenes or is it me as an artist? And as an artist, okay, what is it where you stand for? What do you feel, the kind of music? And uh, is there an audience for it? And how do I reach the audience? If you talk about marketing, that's it. Marketing is about, okay, product, and how do you sell it? Marketing. In the end, that's, that's, you need to make money one day. So, and how do you make money is, yeah, if you have an audience where you can share your music with. And how do you reach that audience? How do you get engagement? Yeah, that's the whole magic, I would say. As a record label first, but also as a do-it-yourself artist. Uh, what do you think it, this is heading towards? Because so like there's been like Facebook, Instagram, uh, yeah, that, TikTok, that's it. And yeah, and like what's your vision on no, yeah, what's coming? Uh, it, you can wait for something to be happening, you know. But I'm very convinced that you need to start. You know, we can talk about it, but let's start. Let's start on social media. Let's claim your own artist profile, your artist name. 
then you release music, like I said. It needs to be consistent on the music releases, on the music itself, and on the posts on the marketing. It need, and it needs to be organic. It needs to, if you're an artist like Dua Lipa, look at, it, look at where she came from and what she did. She played in Eurosonic Noorderslag. I don't know if you remember that. That's where she started. And Eurosonic Noorderslag, to be honest, we know her as a superstar. But Eurosonic Noorderslag has nothing to do with dance music or club. That's all about singer-songwriting. And that's exactly what she is now. Only she's very popular, but that's where, where she started. So if you start on marketing, we always think about the end. No, you have to start at the beginning, okay? Who are you? What do you want to tell? What's the story? And Dua Lipa, she is really smart. She's, she has a manager. She even, I think her dad is now her manager, I think. She, she split from the manager. But like on Chesto, like on David Guetta, if you have success like Chesto for 20 years, you know, that's not, then you are not a one day fly. That's so they really understand what is the audience and how do I keep engagement with the audience? What do I have to do to be different? And I think what for Dua Lipa was it that she was maybe 18, 19. She was writing songs and making songs and do the live performances for the girls of 18, 19, 14. So she was exactly uh, what, uh, what the audience was. Yeah, not, and at least she, she did it, you know, and for her, she still makes, she writes her own songs and it's very, everyone can sing along with these songs and of course she gets help maybe on the production or and that's everything what you can, uh, but I think there was a lot of following in the beginning because she was a singer songwriter and of course she had a record deal, first a smaller label, then a big label like Warner. And then the advantage of that is that you have a release worldwide and promotion worldwide and promotion tools set up. But that's the end. The beginning is, okay, where did it start at? Singer songwriter, Eurosonic Nonderslag, not on EDC Las Vegas, for example, or Tomorrowland. No, she started in a small venue, singer songwriter. Um, and her, her, her magic is that she is what the girls want to be. You know, she is her own fan. She's her own... You know what I mean? Like, uh, and the, her trick is to, uh, because she, yeah, artists become older, she grows older. So her trick is, and, and you know, maybe David Guetta and Chesto is maybe the wrong example, but still it's an example. Although you get older because they're granddads, you know, they're over 50, I'm over 50, but still you need to keep, be, keep, uh, uh, be relevant to the 14 year olds and the 18 years olds. If you can do that, and that's the challenge for Dua Lipa, to attract also the new generation. She grows up, you know, she's 18, now she's 28, I don't know. So she grows up with the 28s, but she need, still needs to attract the 14 year olds. So also she can, you know, in her social media, she still needs to do things 16 year, 17 year olds can also do, you know. So the, the gap, you know, the, the, di the distance, you, know, you have to make it smaller and keep an eye on that. So like on Chesto, yeah, he, he, the last 10 years, he didn't grow older, you know, and still he makes music for the clubs, you know, or, and still he's relevant and kids still make, still love his songs, you know, the 16 year olds. So that's, that's again, marketing to stay relevant. And these are very good examples. Well, because like I explained, like on Pink, you know, the reason why she did the duet with her very younger daughter, she, they wrote the song together. She had a hit last year with her daughter. That makes her very relevant to, to also the younger people and also the, to the granddads. Like another example, Elton John, he had a song with du Dua Lipa. Do you know why that happened? Because um, it makes her uh, uh, mature for the older people. Elton John, and it makes Elton cool with the younger people. You know what I mean? So, it's if you talk about marketing, that is marketing. Why Chesto had a, had a track out with Martin Garrix? Why did he do that, do you think? And 7up endorsed it in the US. Big endorsements. I did the deal. 
And why 7up want to be relevant with Chesto's age, uh, fan page, engagement, but also on Martin Garrix. They spent millions on the commercials. It was really great. So it, it's all about marketing then. Once you have a fan base, brands want to touch base with the fan base, you know, on, on marketing, on synchronization deals, something what Collab has automated. You know what synchronization rights are? If you have publishing, if you have master, um, Buma Sterma do the collection and, and Sena does the collection on the performing rights, on the mechanical rights. But to use a song in a branded post, in a radio commercial, in a commercial movie or in a game, that's up to the owner of the master and the publishing. That's to do the deal or not and to negotiate the deal. That's not uh, up to the copyright societies, that's up to the rights holders. And if you are a do-it-yourself artist, you can be in a podcast, for example. Only to be in a podcast, the podcast producer needs a sync deal. And we automated that for do-it-yourself artists. Because to educate the, you guys as a writer, composer and a producer on what is sync, you want to be in a game, right? In a, the new Fortnite, you want to be with your music. That's, because if you are in the game, you get a lot of exposure through the gamers. And maybe you have a top hit in America. But to, do, to be in it, in Fortnite game, that's synchronization. Bima Sema is not doing that for you. Sena is not doing that. And a record label could do that, but only for the record. And only if they are asked for. But how cool would it be for an independent artist to be in a new Heineken commercial or in a podcast of, uh, of, a, of uh, the guy Jutta Leerdam is dating? What's his name? What would happen if he uses your music, you know, in his new post and say, hey, this is my new hit. But, and, and he can do that through Facebook music, but what he comes up with a new sunglasses and he's paid for by the sunglasses, then it's a branded post and you need to have sync, synchronized it. You have to do a sync deal with the master and the publishing owner. And that's still a blind spot on social media, but it's, it's rights and you need to protect them. We want, as an independent artist, you want to be in that commercial because it brings exposure. But if you are Justin Bieber and Jake Paul is promoting a new sunglass with the music of Justin Bieber, that's out of the question, that's not possible. Because Universal will put a claim in it. Or they will ask a million dollars. Because it attracts also not only Jake Paul's fan base, but also of Justin Bieber. That's synchronization, right? So all the music used in games, videos, in a game trailer, in a Hollywood movie, or even video land, uh, podcasts, that's all sync. I saw, you know, Sylvie Meis maybe. I saw she was promoting, uh, Sylvie Meis is a big influencer from Holland, from Germany, with a million followers. And she still uses music and she says Werbung, which means promoted post. And then she's promoting a product with commercial music behind it. And I'm 100% sure that it's not, it's not cleared, it's not synced. But um, like I said earlier, uh, Sony has 4 million copyrights, but only 30,000 are synced. So it's not, you know, there's a lot of independent music available, but we don't have, we don't know how to offer it in a legal way. So Collab has promoted, uh, made it made the mar marketplace, like in Collab House you can work, an artist can work with an influencer to promote you know, the influencer is promoting the music and the artist gets exposure for his music and hopefully it will end up with streams, you know, so, but at least it's marketing because you promote each other so you create more fan base. Because on, to promote your music, it's nice that you reach the audience what you already know and they follow you, but it's much more better to uh, reach the people you don't know yet. And so you have to collab, collaborate. So influencers work together on Collab House with music. And mu so music artists offer their music to be used by influencers because they get exposure if it's used. And, and influencers can promote music of cool new independent artists. And they grow together because that fan base grow. So that's the marketplace. And we built the Sync, sync Marketplace where artists are offering music to, to be used in podcasts, either for free or for 50 euro or whatever, for 30 seconds, 60 seconds of full use and for a, call, for a podcast or a game, and you can set up terms and a fee. So it's pre-cleared 
and a podcast producer can look for music within the budget and the style of music. They, they, uh, they select the music, you get an agreement, an invoice if it's paid for, and you have uh, legalized the use in a sync. Automated. And education for uh, music makers like yourself, but also influencers, they have no clue. Okay, do you have to pay for that? And okay, where can I pay? Or do I need to clear it? On podcasts or gamers, you know, on YouTube. Yeah, they promote a lot of products. If if you if you are big on as a gamer or Jack Paul, he promotes products. Or Tequila, you know, yeah, they promote it. And they use music sometimes, but they need to clear it. If you promote a product on social media, you need to clear it. The music, what you use. Uh, what was the question? Oh yeah, marketing. So as an artist to being used, you know, by, in a commercial by George Clooney uh, for his tequila brand, you know, you reach millions of followers. So an artist can say, please use my music in a sync for free because he gets followers. He, he creates more exposure through the sync and also more following, more engagement. So he can promote his next record better. So you need to start. And sync for me is an obvious reason for independent artists, they have the rights, master publishing, that's the advantage. If you don't have a record label, you own the master. If you don't have a publisher, you still own the publishing. So you can do the sync yourself. And to be honest, if you want to use Justin Bieber in a Heineken commercial, Justin Bieber's songs are written by six writers, six publishers. The publishers have managers with the writers. And then you have Justin Bieber, he makes records with more artists. Every artist has also a manager. <laughs> so to get a sync cleared of Justin Bieber, it takes maybe a year. Although, you know, trends on music and also on sync or in commercials, is very fluid, it goes really quick. So you cannot sit and wait for one year to clear music for a sync, more or less, I would say. So that's why we build it for you guys. To educate you about sync and also you know, educate influencers and podcast producers, what is sync, where do you can clear it? So uh, if, if you have a song, you can just upload it to Clubhouse? Yes. Uh, a lot of people can select as a... Yeah. So you do, you can choose if you want to have it distributed to DSPs, eh, to have it for five euro or five percent of the revenue, so it's for free. Uh, you get paid afterwards, uh, same for us. But the good thing is, so you can, you can distribute it, but that's not, you can also do it through someone else, uh, through another company or another platform to digital distribution, but you can use the sync platform or the collab platform. That's up to you how you want to use it. Because I believe spinning records was, became very popular and we always had rights, you know, a uh, record deal or publishing deal because you, we had already a platform with social media. So artists came to us, they want to have music success, but also because we had 40 or 100 million followers, if we promote an artist with a new record through our social media, they grow instantly also on their own social media. So we were a double investment for them to get music uh, profile, but also artist profile on the social media. So we needed always, yeah, difficult agreements, not good for us and yeah, also good for the artists, but more favorable because we put something on the table extra, you know, rather than, Warner Music has no social media, you know, so Spinning Records had social media. So you brand your own artist, what you release, not only the music, but also the artist itself. So we put something extra on the table. So the agreements, you know, the record business, the music business is all about agreements. And where I thought after when I sold it to Warner or to any company, I, saw, I thought, okay, how can I help me personally, the independent artist to promote the music? to create exposure. And that's why I came up with the idea to create Collab House, because it's empowering artists. You can do it, but these are the tools how to do it, at least to create exposure. And, on, and trying to be a, a, a solution for influencers and for brands to do it yourself. And hopefully it works. Yeah, we have 60, 70,000 users now and we're making steps, you know, improving the platform. We just introduced chatting. So you can, in the platform, you can chat with an influencer because first you find each other. The influencer is looking for the right artist and the right music. He puts it, you know, in the profile 
then you find each other and you chat about do doing a collaboration. It makes sense. At first it was more static, so now we introduce chatting. Thank you. But I'm making Dutch music and I see the market is still quite small in the Netherlands. Yes. Are you going to promote it more in the Netherlands? Or are yeah, at least we have influencers also from the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, some of them. So you need to work, if you have Dutch music, to work with influencers who have a following in Holland. But you can put out in, in, the, in the search engine the territory. And then you come up with Nederland or the Benelux or Europe. You can figure out a collaboration with the artists, you know, with an influencer you are looking for, either by language or, or sp uh, interests like sports or fashion, um, but also the territory, the age, the, the amount of followers. These are, yeah, and you can search through AI to your uh, ideal collaborator on the, on, as an influencer or as an influencer on the artists. Then you can see, okay, are you looking for a flat fee? collaboration or a, or a collaboration for free or royalty collaboration that's also possible and then you start chatting to each other by saying hey i like you you want a date uh, no you want to collaborate with my music <laughs> <laughs> so it's i try to bring with the team eh, i'm not alone with collab house to bring tools for you guys to create you know a career and one release is not a career you know, so you have to be, um, what did I say earlier, uh, consistent with uh, releases, making music, the style of music. So you start building your own brand and you create engagement. That's not happening by one release or one post. And, and indeed, you have to do your own marketing. But influencers, you know, uh, they become popular because they are their sales. Peter Valley or Bram Krikke, you know these guys? They are very uh, uh, original, I would say. Dua Lipa is original as well. So and she is uh, consistent in what she looks and what the kind of music she puts out. Still trying to be innovative in styles and music. Also on the marketing, what she's doing. So that's all about, you know, if you want to to have a career in music industry, be consistent in what you do. That's my advice for you guys. So since how long is the platform existing? We started it in uh, March, slowly, step by step, improving all the tools. So now we are 10 months further and everything is working. You can chat yeah, and still we need much more users. You know, on first we focused ourselves on, you know, if an influencer comes to the platform and there's no music, yeah, then he's gone, it's instant. So first we focused on, you know, trying to get much artists involved to have their music uploaded, either their sales or a record label with the back catalog or artists who have a back catalog. So there's uh, thousands of tracks in all kinds of genre on the platform. And hopefully, and after that, we focused ourselves on influencers. And now it's a little bit more in balance. Yeah, now we try to improve and trying to work on things to get millions of users. But also, to be honest, TikTok started somewhere. And also Triller, I don't know if you know Triller. That's a platform, the competition more or less of TikTok. But TikTok is more about uh, uh, volume, where we could say that Triller is much more about helping the independent creators developing you know, a career as influencer or as a music maker. It's a good advice. We tend to work together more closely with Trille uh, in the coming months. Yes, and there are market leader like TikTok is market leader in Europe, but Trille is market leader in India, for example. If you want to sell music in India, I don't know, but and also in Africa, you know, like Spotify is is we feel you know is the market leader in the world, which is correct, but not in South America, uh, not in Africa, not in Russia where local players are the market leaders. So Spotify is nice, but try to have your music on board. Like on Facebook Music, that's a DSP. 
and Facebook music is uploading, is sharing the music with Instagram. So if you, if you are only on Spotify, you are not in Instagram with your music because it's not on Facebook music. So how do you promote your music in Instagram? You know, yeah, you cannot uh, uh, include it in your posts or in the reels or, uh, so you need to be on multiple DSPs. You said you can't use uh, your Spotify upload in the post or reels? I think. Because I just did like... But I think Facebook Music is like a DSP for Instagram as well. I think the back side of the music what you put in, like let's say you do a show, uh, a reel, yeah, I'm not yeah. the best in social media, but if you want to include music, which is already there, so not if you put it outside, and then you include it already. But if you, if you in Instagram, you want to include music, so you go to the music in, uh, library of of Instagram. Mm -hmm. The backside is of Facebook Music, and that works like a DSP. It works like a stream. Also on TikTok itself, yeah. yeah, because first you need like on Thriller, you need to have huge engagement following fans and then you get a deal like spotify the major record labels if you look on on a playlist on netflix you see that and that's the real story that spotify was already there and the re the major record labels were the last ones with music on spotify to be included because what they do they sit on the catalog and they hire one lawyer for universal sony and warner they negotiate one deal so they were shareholder even spotify until they share their music. The same happened on TikTok. So first, you know, you need to have it as a promotion tool, but then it becomes because uh, if there's no money made on these social media platforms, then there's no, and it's only 30 sec seconds like promotion, then it's okay for the major to have them used. But once there's a revenue stream like promoted posts or branding, and it's used more than 30 seconds, then the record labels want to have stream income. And then, so then they said, okay, now we have to do a deal. Otherwise you don't get the music anymore. That's the power of these big, they, they you know, 90% out of all music income is made by the three major record labels. So it's, they have a lot of power. And it's up to us as independent creators to, you know, do something about it and help ourselves, you know. Because the whole idea is that most of the record deals, like spinning, puts 15 releases out per week. So that means 60 per, per month. Maybe, you know, only two or three are worthwhile uh, money-wise. Uh, so a lot of these records, you know, they disappear. So the bad thing is about, the good thing is a record label can make your career, you know, on social media and in international promotion, etc. The bad thing is, yeah, if they have a lot of music they put out. So hopefully, you know, they say, ah, we're gonna make you famous, we put out the record, we do the best promotion ever. But that's only happening with three out of 60 of the records. <laughs> you know, and of course, Chesto is, he, if they put a record of him out, he promotes it himself. So that's, he is already a big brand. So, you know, that's, if you look at the top 40 in Spotify in Holland, you know, you see major artists, you know, uh, who have international success, that's part of it, but very uh, little uh, new artists, you know, also after COVID or during COVID, look at the DJs. How many DJs are broken careers the last four or five years? Out of Holland in the Netherlands, none, except Maup maybe, but that was one record which was very popular. And 10 years ago, it was every year we had a top, 20 new DJ from Holland, you know? So that's all about uh, chances. So that's, uh, uh, so do a record deal uh, only when, you know, uh, the, ch the time is right. If you, if you sit and wait and let them make the difference, yeah, rather wait and, and do it yourself. That's the reason why I say to you guys, if you, um, you have to start, you know, and create your own fan base, do your own marketing, because that's half of the job, music and marketing, create your exposure, start your own fan base, to get maybe the record deal, which makes worthwhile. 
And, at, and if you didn't, at least you have your fan base and you can start over again. But don't sit and wait for the record deal because the chances are very minimal. So you have to do it yourself. And the good thing is of internet, all these new tools like GZ or Collab House, yeah, uh, and that stuns AI can improve making music. ChatGPT can make your biography or can make a picture what you can use for artwork. So all these smart tools help you to improve the music or the marketing and promotion of yourself. Questions? Come on, I'm here. What else? Music, publishing, artists. I'm curious what it does to your point of view on the industry when you hear that out of um, 60 uh, releases, there's maybe three or four that actually do something. Because of course, a lot of people have this whole thing like, oh, the labels, they make greedy deals and everything. But I think it's important you realize that they also have their operations and everything. And yeah, from those deals, like in the end, there's a lot of projects that are yeah, not working and course. failing. So that explains also the deal. And they have their own priorities. You know, they have already big artists. So they rather focus on that. That's a sure shot. And it's a lot. These three companies are, are on the stock exchange, you know. So it's all about a lot of people and all they want to cover their ass, you know. So the NR says, OK, I love this record. But uh, and uh, when it didn't happen, so and the most of the time, it, it's not a success. Yeah? That's that's normal out of Look at uh, spinning, you know, three out of 60, that's a success. So most of the time it doesn't happen. Then it's the fault of the A&R, of the promoter, the marketeer, of the, the lady at the toilet, you know. Yeah, it's everybody's fault, you know, except for, uh, yeah, whatever. So, and, and the artist says, yeah, it's all their fault. And maybe the track was not good enough. That's also, uh, yeah, or, or too early or too late, whatever. So, yeah, uh, so don't over... Romantize, romant make it romantic. Yeah, yeah the, the 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 record deal or the publishing deal. Ah, now now they're gonna work for me. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. So don't sit and wait for them. Uh, create yourself. Anything else? So you talked about like how back in the day you would do the kind of like top. Down. Bottom up, yeah, bottom yeah. Up, uh, thing and that or top down, that's yeah. Or like I meant bottom up, yeah. Um, and that that's really just a very different game now. Like, how do you see it now then in the internet age? It's still the same. So you need to, like I said, you need to start first music, and then you have the music. Okay, what then? Yeah, you start with a logo. You start with an uh, artist name. So that's, that's already bottom up. And then, okay, you have t a thousand followers. Okay, how do you get 10,000? Yeah, you work with an influencer, another artist. You know, smaller artists, big artists. Yeah, the smaller becomes big, you know? Yeah. And the big artist work, wants to work with Ed Sheeran. Yeah, it's bigger. So that's all how it works. That's why the collaborations in the music industry, singer, sing, uh, male, female, rapper, you know, they all collaborate. That's, no, that's, that's from 50 years. Sugar Hill Gang, they, yeah, they were sampled, you know, and because if you sample, then you tribute to the other artist and you use his fan base. Um, so it's still bottom up, I would say, especially for you guys, start, start working. Uh, small things make the difference, can make the difference. On playlisting, yeah, if you have a thousand streams, how do you get a hundred thousand streams? If you have a hundred, how do you get a million? So all these steps still works the same and never be satisfied. <laughs> that that's it and every record yeah is is you have to start over again but that's and, it, this. and it can be intimidating because it's like oh well like where does it have to go but wherever you want to go you just have yeah, like, if you believe like, it you have like to, these you have to guys like Don yeah. Diablo or, or Averjack or David Guetta they they still think okay how okay the market changed the music changed the fan base the, the age the target group Okay, how do I change myself in that? Why David Guetta, he always uses samples. Do you know why? Because then you think, hey, I know this song. He changed with the sample. That's the recognition. Akon of Nana Hey Hey. I don't know if you remember, remember the song. David Guetta used it again in his record. 
And why did he do that? Because then you have a recognition of the 20-year-old, the 30-year-old. And remember, Fiesta with the Sun Club, was, that was my first hit in 1998. That record was used by Akon, Nan, Remember Nana, Hey Hey, and by Underdog Project. So that song is already 30 years uh, success. And still they, they, you know, so also in your production, you can use sound-alikes. So David Guetta is doing that in the track itself. And he, he always works with the producers of that specific moment. And why? Because they are relevant and that makes him relevant. The same is what Madonna did the last 40 years. She worked in the 80s with a guy from New York. The 90s, every 10, every 10 years when she came out with a new album, she used the producer of that specific moment. She, she knew always, okay, then the sound at least is relevant. Do people like really, and like the teams really deliberately think like when making the record, this is like, we gotta have this or like this. Sample. For you, it's a question. I'm very sure. Like David, they, they David Guetta, yeah. Look, maybe 20 years ago, it all started off with success, you know, but then if you have success, you know, you see one day flies. Uh, Fede Le Grand, he had one hit. Put your heads up in the air. I don't know if you know it. He had one big hit. So why, why 20 years later he cannot produce another hit? Or five years later, or, you know? So maybe it was a one-trick pony. And he's a cool DJ, but, and he had luck in the production. But on David Guetta, 20 years ago he had success, and still he has success. So the, it's all about not making the music, but, but about the marketing. How do I make or, or stay relevant? Yeah. But do they think about that when they make the music? Absolutely. He makes. He has an alter ego. Because he is on Ojoaia. I don't know if you know if, if you have been there in Ushuaia and Ibiza. Oh, yeah. But yeah. yeah, but that's three, four hour set. And he starts off with very cool music and he ends off with his hits. Because, an L, because I tell you, the kids are coming early, but the tables come in around nine or 10, the tables, VIP tables. And they are bought, not by the kids who are in the ground, you know, in the floor. The tables are bought by 30, 40, 50 year olds, older people. And they know the hits from the radio, not from the club. But uh, so he plays cooler records in the early stage of the, of the performance and later the commercial hits. Because then the other people who come in, who pay the most money, you know, so it's all, so he needs cooler records for the kids to, and he plays in clubs and he needs commercial records who can be on the radio and he makes records in Europe different. He has certain records with, which are hit in Europe and certain records were, which are hit in America. And he was the first in the 2000s where he used Kid Cudi. And Kid Cudi made David Guetta, he saw, so his success is because he's him, his own manager. And it's about music, but it's also about marketing. So he's a great marketeer because he saw the most expensive tables, the most expensive clubs are in America. Miami, not so necessarily in Los Angeles, but in Las Vegas. But who pay for the tables? That's the 40 year olds, the gamblers. Not the kids 20 years old, the festival goers. So he needs to have a hit in the US. So he thought, okay, I work with Kelly Rowland. I work with Kid Cutie because they have already a fan base in the US. I make a cool record. It makes me cool. It makes them cool because their records are played in Europe and his records are played in the US. It was for him mathematics. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not about the feeling. I like the record. No, yeah, that's important, but more important. The marketing needs to be perfect. So he's making records with that in mind. Is that like his team thinking of all this stuff or is it like actually him that's making these moves? He is, uh, uh, he's performing in the, all the clubs. And so he knows his fan base. He has two managers who are lawyers. They have no clue about music. Yeah, it, it's a machine. And also his, the, there's a business partner. I don't know if you know. Uh, Jean-Jacques Jean 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 and yeah, Charles yeah. he has two friends, yeah. but they are lawyers. You know, it's not about, you know, about getting the hit in the US. That's him. But uh, it's, it's, it's a machine 
but I know the mission. Yeah, it's the marketing. Good, and but there's also like uh, some boundaries that will not be crossed within that team on based on feeling and uh, like it's still a uh, musician. Yeah, not yeah, the, yeah. because yeah. Uh, like we said earlier, as an artist, how do you create artist and music profile? You need to know your fan base. So that's the same with spinning records. We knew, you know, Radio 538 was a market leader radio in Holland. And we knew what kind of music there could be played on the radio. So we were putting out the music, what they would like. So we turned it around because if we had 538, we had a big audience and all the artists would come anyway, because they want to be on 538, because they want to be, you know, on the big festivals in Holland and in Belgium and in Germany, because, and once we had a hit in Holland, we could say a radio hit, we could say to England, Hey, listen, radio is playing the record. BBC should play it as well. So you, so you, you have as an artist, like David Guetta is doing, okay, what, where do I want to go as an artist? I want to have hits in America and in Europe. So, okay, okay. How do I create that? And then he was looking, okay, what kind of music do I need for that? It's cutie had one hit, but in, in, in the world, uh, day and night, but multiple hits in the US and a big following. So for him was it, okay, I want that following. And what kind of record can be played in the US and in, whole, in, in Europe on the radio? And Kelly Rowland, yeah, he saw, you know, uh, Kelly Rowland saw an upside because she was part of um, Destiny Child. That was over. So she needed a hit also in Europe. And he wanted to have a hit in the US where she was still very popular. So it's about marketing, but still, yeah. So what is your audience? Where is your audience? What is your audience? And how do I reach them? And that's, th and that's the reason why he's not successful. One hit, one album, no, 20 years. So that's fantastic. Talk with him. He's amazing. He's amazing. He's amazing. He's a great guy. And he's, he's other than that, he's always working on the music himself in the studio. He, could, he has three studios in Ibiza, so he's, he's, uh, he gets producers in his studios in Ibiza because he has residency in the Pasha and Ushuaia and he travels in Europe, you know, most of the DJs, but I'm very DJ because that's my experience because with, a f with an airplane they can do a lot of performances, you know, in Europe, so they do on Tuesday Pasha and Wednesday they are in uh, Tomorrowland and on Thursday they are in Europe somewhere else. But his, uh, he feels uh, what is happening because he gets the new producers, once they have a hit uh, in Holland or with a record, he gets them in the, in the studio with them. The and he, yeah, and he learns from them, you know, and they want to be p work with David because he's a superstar and David wants to work with them because it's the new upcoming guys. And he learns about programming from them and how they work on the sounds, new sounds. Animals was, you know, now you don't hear it on Radio 538 or Q music because it's an annoying sound. It's very hard. It was a big trend in 13 and 14 with uh, um, EDM sound. But it's too hard. It's really worked in clubs and on festivals, but not on the radio, except for that trend in that specific area. After that, you had Deep House with Ola Rehonens, which was f much more radio friendly. Yeah. Uh, because on playlist you have a burn rate and a skip rate. I don't know, also on the radio, I don't know if you are, are familiar with these words. A record which you hear a lot, you know, on the radio, for example, it's playlisting. Eh? Yeah. You hear records at a specific time, uh, a specific day on the radio be because of the playlist. Uh, and you like a radio station because they play a certain kind of records. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what they sell as a radio station. But if you hear a record too much, they call it, and it's annoying for you because you hear it too much, then it's a burn rate. Mm. And if it's, if it's a record which is annoying, so too hard on the sound, like EDM, yeah. animals, that's a skip rate. Burn rate me means, yeah, it's an annoying, so you go to another station. Or in the playlist, you go to another track. Yeah. Or a skip rate, you could also go to another playlist. Yeah. So you see always a playlist with 100 tracks, and you see the top 10 who are tested the best. 
So no skip rate, no burn rate in the top 10. But to try it, you start with a new track in your playlist. If you say you have a million followers on your playlist, not in the top 10. No, you start a little bit. You see how it responds in the elbow. Yeah. And then you fool with the leader. Same on the radio. I have a radio alarm type or a dance mesh. That's the record which is played six to 10 times a day. And then I'm the test it with a pen on. And if it's an annoying record after a week, you don't hear it then. But if it's testing really well, yeah, you hit four or five, six weeks. If it, after that still, sometimes you hear a record which is already not popular on Spotify and for, yeah, but you still hear it on the radio because it's testing so well. Yeah. It's, it's part of the identity of the radio section. Yeah, the music that make. Skip grain in the flames. Uh, I have a question. So for the platform that you have built, how does the help desk work? Is it that there is an like, actual visual person to, uh, in play? To no, we have Marco who's helping you if you have questions. You can upload your track or uh, if there's something missing like a label copy you could, or, uh, or an LC code, uh, he's helping you with that in a, in a manual way. He's a person. We have all our chatbots coming. Uh, so that, that's about it. We have a frequently asked questions, either in table or in a video to help you use the platform. And for instance, if there is like um, an issue, um, is there like a official person that you can contact? Yeah, that's Marco. Oh, that's, yeah, you can contact him by email. That's a specific email for, uh, yeah, uh, especially on music artists, you know, yeah, you have to get the products complete. You know, a label copy, a master, sometimes there is something wrong or you use a sample, which is fingerprints. Yeah. So that's a reason why it's not growing on Spotify because it's illegal. Something you did would be possible eh? you without your, without, you know, or sometimes people do it on purpose and they abuse the platform. It's also possible. Yeah, because uh, I have a question. Uh, this, this question is with TuneCore. Yeah. And I was uploading the song. I had some issues with the uh, Yerix and uh, the uploading as well because I had some explicit uh, content. Yeah. So this is why I was wondering. Yeah, it's not Chink or, but it's Spotify he retracts that. You know, so it's filtered. Funcore is one of these companies like Colette House or uh, Believe. They upload tracks to Spotify and Apple Music, but it's filtered. Know what I mean? Yeah. So before Spotify has their own filters to prevent that you use just a beaver samples. So then it stops. You cannot upload it because it's in an explicit language. Yeah. Um, TuneCore doesn't want to uh, harm the relationship that they have with uh, Spotify. So it's Spotify is giving guidance on what the, is possible or what isn't. Yeah, we all have to uh, respect that. Yeah. Because otherwise they get complaints or lawsuits. No, on just fear. You don't want to get a lawsuit. You know what I mean? Say it's the same on YouTube. That's with fingerprints. That's the filter. That's an English to use it just a Weber and put a brand in it. You get a notice or it's what's or you get a TuneCore has the problem, but it's not TuneCore. Yeah, they have the problems because of the demands from Spotify. Yeah, but then the reason that I, I'm asking this question is uh, the first song that I released was with the distro kit, and I was uh, just wondering if I could get in contact with somebody. But there yeah. was a chat bot, and there was no reply. So then I again, uh, went to TuneCore, and that is an actual person yeah. who replies to your emails. With Marco, yeah, he can he can tell you what I'm saying. Yeah. And then, yeah, work around it. Make a beat. You said that in everything. Something like it. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not a creator myself. I, I, so that was also the reason, you know, why I started the record day with a production company. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm a business guy and I love to work with talented, creative people. Uh, but I'm not a, so I'm, I'm not a music maker myself, you know, so I, and it was balance. I need you guys, you know, if I can reach.
mm-hmm. like I'm mad at mother, yeah, it's always about Armin van Buren, still is, you know. So I'm not Armin van I'm not a DJ. That was the good thing. So I helped her really develop, and there was never competition. Yes, so you said we'll learn some things about trends, which you can see in the Irish music, but then the Irish music, like what trends can you see? Yeah, the trend is that on making music and promoting music is that there's a lot of trends. Yeah, update with that. On making, like what, that, the said EDM and Deep House. EDM was, like I said, like on animals and tsunami redubs. That's the kind of records which you still hear, but it's not testing your videos or on radio because the sound is too hard. Um, and that's also the trend. Eh? That it's not too hard uh, because everyone wants to be in the playlist and, and not to be kicked out of the playlist or radio once they are in it. Um, but the trend is that either it's still, either you're a superstar, like Taylor Swift, and you're in the playlist everywhere, in the top 40, in France, Germany, or it's about local. If you go to the top, that's what I get this afternoon to, in advance of this, this meeting is to check, okay, what is now the trend in Holland? You see a lot of Dutch spoken artists, Anton and artists I don't know yet. But also Taylor Swift, for example. But you see in France, again, you see Sibren, France artists. And also in Germany, you see also the same. So it's, you know, uh, so what is the trend? Can the trend is still, yeah, independent artists compared to all the major artists? Then? Uh, because the chances, because everyone is playing the same music in the playlist of these big artists. And so there's a, the, the, the mid side. How are you? And what do you listen to when you when you're home and you want just to listen to so yeah. you in the car I like energetic records. So not not annoying sounds like EDM. Said that just uh, yeah, these kind of records are really well. But also Kelvin Harris uh Ed Sheeran I love. You know, the, the amazing thing is uh, that's a little bit also about what I'm what I'm trying to give you is like what Anne Shearing does and is similar to what Amma did in the seventies. What did he? Yeah, you're nothing. What what did you what, what are similarities? How I see it is yes. If you listen to an Abba song the first five seconds, you know exactly which artist it is or what song it's about. And why it is there? Because it's a very original uh, sound and they put and Kevin Harris just the same they put in the first five six seconds also the melody line the the more or less the, the chorus already what the song is about but then very minimal with like a guitar or piano or a sample to start with the f- because then you have to go back why is it that if you hear five seconds of Ed Sheeran why you know exactly it's Ed Sheeran and it's and you know it's on so that's, that's, you know, we're talking about making music and making marketing. That's, that's the same. That's both. Be original. And that means also the intro and sounding, you know, and like uh, singers. Doesn't singers, male, female, necessarily don't have to have a beautiful voice. As long as it has identity. Like for Ed Sheeran, yeah, you can talk about do you like his voice, yes or not. But if you hear him singing, you know, that's Ed Sheeran. So that's all part of be original, be creative. And Ed Sheeran, he sometimes, yeah, he, he uses sounds. And the sound is not a song. You know, you, you, if you take from a record which is very successful, or you take the Hyatt or a piano sound or a guitar sound, that means, that doesn't mean you.
and I'm reaching you with voice or in sound as a writer, composer, singer. So yeah, even you don't have a even you don't need to have a beautiful voice, like Sia. If you hear her singing, is that a beautiful voice? I don't think so, but it's very unique. Big frightening. Mm. That's it really beautiful, but it's it's her. Who else? Singers. Oh, it, yeah, there's so many singers who don't have the best voice. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it, but it's also a taste because, for example, I think Sia is an amazing host. It's so skilled of how trained. The sounds weird, but it's very powerful. You put it in love. And it's her signature. Yeah. If you hear one of the songs, you know, wow, that's Sia. I think that one singing girl was really amazing. Very modest, beautiful. And if you ask David, she didn't want to sing. That did titanium. She didn't want to be shooter. She wrote it as a song for someone else. Had that song, my dear, can find it. But with our Jack, he made the new. That was just the sounds. He had, um, he had another record with that. So Baby said, okay, do that again. And then I got a music later 10 years. But typical sergeant will, yeah. So, yeah, see, I had soon. They would get them five. The sound with our Jack kept bringing it together. They could put the name on it. And they hit. Amazing. So it was like chemistry sometimes. You put things together. That's what Dave is doing all the time. No. So it's about, you know, where do you want to go? It's not about making music. Okay, then yeah, you can do that the whole day, but where do you want to go? What is your next step? Where do you, what, what is your audience? How do you reach them with what kind of sound? What suits you? What does feel organic in yourself? So if you have one hit, you can reproduce the next ones as well because it comes from you rather well, than it's a trick. Or, or did we stole a record or a sound for Sean from someone? That's, I think, you know, before you go in the street. Okay, what is my talent? How will we go to Devon Up? That's where do we want to go? I start, don't take too long. Yes, it's dark and adjust. Kolevas, I started three years ago with Good for Deer. We adjusted Spotify. If you look at our playlist, you see in jazz, the, the, the series called Playlist. The top play is to, uh, that was the marketing tool. It was, it was brought up by a lawyer who said, okay, we need something white people come back to us because they had music available, but Apple Music was there as well. So they figured out, hey, if you have a playlist, people come back. They don't want to miss out on the play. So that was something unique. But they were working on Spotify for four or five years. So they adjust it all the time. Same on music, same as an artist. You can develop, but at least start somewhere. And ask other people, you know, learn. Hey, what do you think? That's an A&R's job. a and is about artists of repertoire from the past, then, where we had a song looking for an artist. But now, you know, it's a good story with Abijek. He made Takeover Control. We had a club hit on vinyl. They we said, okay, I would take now we have to make a radio edit because we go to radio, radio five to eight. Out of the six version minutes, uh, we need we need the radio version. So we went to the studio and he said, Okay, yeah, I have here all these front tools, all the king bass, all the all the, the sport the tracks. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, now we have to make a radio version. And we said, No, we take the same, only we'll make it a little bit shorter. So we only need it. They had all the radio version. They didn't know. It took them for and then for a radio, it needs to be excited. So six minutes. Yeah, that's a radio station wants to pay uh, more records than the competition. So that's why on Radio 5G8, sometimes you hear a song which is 10% for 5% speed, speed it quicker, made quicker. So they make uh, they make more records than the competition in the playlist on the even hour. Um, and for a radio version, yeah, you need a good intro like Alba. You, you don't, there's no version of ABBA for six minutes. No, it's all short. Why? Because then you want to play it again or you play another song for ABBA. So it needs to be intro, outro, and after two minutes, it needs to be excited still. Instead of being repetitive, otherwise they get bored. That's a skimpery. You go to another show. 
go, you need, that's why reps 20 years ago, it came in because after one and a half minutes, you have, you have the chorus, you have the, the, uh, the blast and the chorus, and then you have to come up with something else, either a break or you do a rap for it all. So in the nineties, we had a lot of reps to make it more exact. And, um, um, the hunger. Yeah, it's so in the music itself, it's something about mathematics as well, an arrangement. And an A&R can be part of making the right arrangement to go to radio. That's a great question. Uh, I think, I'm sorry to, we will have to trade <laughs> around this stuff. It's super interesting. I, I could go on like the whole night. I think the greatest tool. Yeah, the other yeah, people can dream already. Yeah, yeah. I would like it if you come back if you something yeah. and someone. Because I think, yeah. I don't know what so I, I can touch anything. Yeah. Something. Yeah. I'm going to you guys on the questions and hopefully I, yeah, can contribute to information things you don't know or you want to ask for, or you know, already. And there's, there's so much to learn. Still learning every day yeah. uh, in music business or also publishing yeah. our. Or uh, as an entrepreneur, or as an artist, you know, you look at them gatherings and never things, you know, but what do you go? You always full with ideas and, and, and new things. Yeah, because his success is that he really likes what he's doing. I think and you can see that if he's online, you know, you see it, he's never, uh, he had a heart attack uh, last year, brain and tech, uh, very bad, but still had, yeah, he was, he was in the hospital six months, uh, six months ago, really bad, but uh, you, see, you, you don't see it because yeah, it keeps him motivated to do what he really loves. And that's not about the money. Money is part of that comes when you have success, but that's not focus. You know, focus is success, love money. Keep that in that all. Success. Good. Uh, yeah, they, they have been. Really, so they brought some some flyers where you can find more information and just try it, you know, and see where it brings. And they also brought some some t-shirts for if you're interested. She works. Give the feedback for okay. I I don't understand what this is. You know, we started off and then we thought okay, we'll put everything in. But I think you said yeah, but it's too complicated, you know. And where the website <laughs> change now, it's more more very matter. 